Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, hey everybody, welcome to a special edition of the Strength Coach Podcast. We are here with the inventor of combine training, according to Pete Williams, Mike Boyle. Coach, how you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? All right. I just said that because in your new product, Complete Youth Training, you were talking about, you were joking about how uh, yeah, how he said that in your book. But uh, yeah, man, excited for I watched it uh, the other day and uh, got, got a chance to, uh, to uh, kind of go over most of it, 90% of it, of the lectures. And uh, so, so let's talk about this. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's the, the, the what we need to do as strength and conditioning professionals, what I got from kind of the beginning of it is we're really, we really, our most important job is parent education. Talk to us about this, about, about this whole product and about where you're going with it. Yeah, I think ultimately this product, the initial, the first two and a half hours, the lecture part is really going to educate a strength coach as to how to talk to a parent. I think we've got, Everybody has the same problem that they're running into. When we're in the strength and conditioning business, particularly if we're in the youth sports performance business, we're marketing to parents. We're marketing to parents who are either uninformed or misinformed. And we need to be able to have a conversation with those parents about why what they think is the best way to do this isn't the best way to do it because, and this is one of the things that I talk about early on in the product, what makes a parent successful at their business or at their job or whatever it is, is kind of this stuff that we read about all the time on Twitter, on the internet, you know, the single minded focus, you know, I've got to be totally focused on this and parents naturally assume, well, if my son wants to be a soccer player, we need to do the same thing. We need to be single-mindedly focused on soccer. We need to be laser-focused on soccer. And that's not the reality of trying to develop a really good young athlete. It doesn't work. And so there's there's a lot of education there about talking to parents and being able to say to parents, this doesn't work and this is why. And we talk about the early succeeder phenomenon and we talk about grit and we talk about late bloomers and we get into the long-term athletic development idea and why that may not be – exactly what we need to do. But I think the reason coaches are going to like this product is it's going to give them the ability to have these conversations with parents when the parents come in and think, Hey, I want a soccer specific workout. My kid's a soccer player and, or, you know, basketball specific. We get this all the time. I still can't believe sometimes that we're still having these conversations, but in the 20 years that I've been doing this, I don't feel like it's changed because it's not like parents have a steady stream of kids and every year I have a new one. And so I've been through this 20 times and I got 20 kids for a lot of these parents. You might have a boy and a girl. You might have two boys and a girl or whatever, and they might be closely bunched together and they they could kind of go through the process at a similar rate. I'm at it now where I'm, I'm kind of five years apart. My kids are 18 and 13 and I've got a boy and a girl and it's a little bit different, but it's, it is that ability. I, you know, we've talked about this a lot on the podcast. I used to always say Michaela was my little science experiment, my little long-term athletic development child that was doing judo and doing diving and doing swimming and playing soccer. But her, all she wanted to be was a hockey player. And the end result now is that she is a hockey player and she's a hockey player with a national championship ring and she's playing at the best program in division one. But I do think it's because I did what I really thought was the right thing early on, and it was very much what everybody else wasn't doing. Absolutely, and I think what's really important, and and people have to know this when they're going to buy the product, is that those first two presentations, you might kind of feel like, hey, I want to get to the training, but I can say take really good notes in these first two and a half uh, first two hours of the presentation, really it's an hour and a half because I think they're 45 minutes each, the first two, but... Because there's so many statistics in there. You quote so many different uh, resources on these different things uh, about, uh, about how, we, how we can educate them. What are some of the things 
uh, that we can, because uh, we can't control it, but you talk about apathy being one of the bigger problems and tacit endorsement. And I think one of the ways if we can educate parents about some of these things, then maybe they can, they're the ones who are going to have to make the change with like, for example, the, you know, you showed that video of the, the soccer kids playing, uh, the little girl, she was adorable who, you know, all the parents had to play on a, uh, what it would be like for them, like little kids on a, on a pitch that was the size of and ice as well. Uh, the hockey guys are playing on those that huge rink and with the huge nets. Like that's what the kids awesome feel. Like. Videos, though. <laughs> What's that? Those are awesome. Oh my videos. god, they are so good. The little girl's awesome. But what you know, what can we do for this apathetic problem that they have? I think we can be the advocate. We can be the person out there. And that's I've been that person forever. I've been saying this, and we were talking about. Uh, the, the article I've written these articles, you know, Road to College. I've I've been literally banging this drum forever, and this is one of the reasons I made the product is to give everybody the information and even more information than I had because I did a lot of research for the product, and I came up with stuff I didn't even realize was there. Some of the Ross Tucker Science for Sports stuff, even saying you know why long term athletic development maybe wasn't exactly the way to go, and that the ten thousand hour thing really didn't work and that things like peak height velocity that I found to be not very practical weren't even really practical. So I got a lot of reinforcement through my research and I feel like now I can talk to a parent as an expert and say to them, no, this isn't, this is not true because what ends up happening a lot is that a self-interested coach tells a parent something that isn't true. And they tell them that to scare them, and they try to scare them with the idea that oh, if you you know if you don't do this with Johnny or Jane, they're going to fall behind and they'll never catch up. And so parents just kind of blindly go along, writing check after check, and it's like all the select teams. I always see Mark's like, why can't I do select this? And I'm like, or you know, and, and we are doing select lacrosse now, quote unquote. But I said sometimes select they're selecting you by your wallet. You know, they're selecting the you know, the people most likely to pay. And you've got to be looking at it and thinking, what is the motivation of this person for this team tournament, whatever it is? And a lot of times you realize the motivation is they need this sport to go year round in order to pay their bills. And that's what I see happening more and more. You used to have the coach who coached three sports. And now you've got all these club people who coach one sport and it just economically makes sense for them to say, Hey, you know, your kid's pretty good. He'd be really good if all he did was soccer year round or all he did was basketball year round or all he did with was hockey year round. But the reality at these younger age groups is that that's not true. And I, it's, and it's that ability to look at parents and be able to say to them, not just with your opinion, oh, this is what I think, but with evidence and say, no, this isn't true. This is, that's, you know, these kids, you know, everybody, and that's why I love about, like, I, we talk about TPI and Greg Rose and these guys. You've got all of these people, but right, USA Hockey through the ADM, everybody's trying to do this now because they know it's the right thing to do, not just for kids, and it's the right thing to do psychologically too, but it is the right thing to do from developing an elite performance standpoint. It's the right thing to do from a keeping your kid healthy standpoint physically. And it's the right thing to do from the standpoint of keeping your kid healthy psychologically. But it's amazing that we still have coaches, quote unquote professionals, who are, in my mind, just flat out lying to people. Yeah. And, you know, here's the thing. Like, it's not an argument. I'm not saying you're misinterpreting this. But, like, with long-term athletic development, one thing you did bring up Erickson – um, in, in the 10,000 hours, which was, he never said 10,000 hours. And if you read peak, you, you know, people know that from peak, his book peak, um, that it was, it was more about deliberate practice. So I, I don't know if he would agree. And that doesn't mean that you're, he's, he's right. If he would agree that soccer it would help your hockey. I'm sure we both know that being more athletic is going to help. Right. But he was really talking about specific deliberate practice, which could help 
in terms of, look, this is what you need to do to get better. So there is that kind of little bit of, even with that it's not 10,000 hours, he still is talking about specific deliberate practice, which might not mean a soccer. He might not agree with that. I don't know, though. Yeah, and that's what I think, and I think some of it is when you're looking at, like, you know, you go back like the Jeremy Frisch stuff, when you're looking at gross motor skills, I would be curious to see what he does think, because I do think that the gross motor aspect of developing a number of skill sets, to me, makes sense, because I think the deliberate practice part, and I don't know, like, I'm not sure what he says, like, it, it would be different, and this is where when you go into, um, like with outliers, if we were talking about something like the violin, very finite, or gymnastics, very finite, where you could work on your routine over and over again, I think that really makes sense. But when you start thinking about a sport, like unpredictability in a sporting environment, I don't know if it does. And it's bringing more of this stuff to light, like you said, you know, the, you know, Erickson and 10,000 hours and outliers and you know, all the good players are born earlier in the year. And, you know, that was one of the things that I showed. That's not true. All the good players weren't, weren't born earlier in the year. And some of the greatest players were born later in the year. And I think there's a lot of stuff that we still don't understand and that will still come out. Because even the deliberate practice idea, games aren't deliberate practice. True. And that's one of the things that, you know, the parents – are signing up for summer tournaments to play. And, you know, we got into the stats about game. They're signing up to play for 30 seconds of contact time, not deliberate practice, nothing even close to deliberate practice, 30 seconds of maybe having the ball on your foot or 30 seconds of having your, you know, the, the puck on your stick or whatever it is over the course of a weekend where you're going to blow your whole weekend, five games, and the poor kid's going to get two and a half minutes worth of anything and nothing approaching deliberate practice. And I think that's the other thing when we start looking at deliberate practice, even with hockey, you know, you start thinking, you know, it starts to break down into skating and shooting and, and those things do need deliberate practice. So I think there's the, 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 the other parts of the equation to, to think about. So I guess the good thing about this is I would not, even try to present that say hey, this is the definitive work. This is really a conglomeration of ideas for people like me who are training kids, where they're going to be able to learn about training kids and, and be able to, I think, at least improve their ability. Absolutely. Um, Mike, one thing, though, and let's go into some of the training now. I just want to kind of go over that and get to that. Um, and you definitely make a definitive argument about uh, this educational piece and uh, why some of this stuff we really need to focus on, uh, what we can do to educate the parents and, and hopefully make some changes. Um, Shrinkton, you were talking about, you know, Okay, from age 11 on, which, you know, that's a whole other argument. You and I have talked about this before. Uh, if you have the environment to do what somebody like Jeremy Frisch is doing, then great. Uh, you don't feel like that's always appropriate in a facility like yours. You might have to do another uh, a licensed facility, you know, MBSC uh, youth or something uh, where they're separate youth training facilities. Um, <laughs> but... Um, but, you know, you're talking about age 11. You think strength and power should be involved. You should be doing that twice. Oh, was it twice a week, right? In yep. the minimum? Or you feel like, you know, three's okay too? Or from 11 on, what do you feel like uh, that uh, should be? Three would be okay. I just don't know if three is realistic. Based on, and this again, this is more kind of as a parent now and seeing the schedule that kids have. Yeah. I think trying to get a kid to the gym three times a week is difficult at least i know for me even you know and I, I own a gym but to try to get mark to the gym three days a week and to whatever hockey practice and lacrosse and homework and everything else so i would have no problem if someone said i'm going to do this three days a week versus two i would have a problem if they said i'm going to do it one versus two because i do think that the thing i worry about is kids being sore all the time and not liking training because they equate training with being sore. And I think when you're doing it two days a week, you don't have that. When you're doing it once a week, you do. Um, 
so you said, yeah, two days and then two to three hours worth of skill training. Uh, and in this time, they're basically, this is your, your idea is learn to train. And that's, you don't care if they're 11 or 14, whatever their training age, if they have a zero training age, they're starting at the same point. You don't care what, uh, as long as you know, they have zero training age. You're, that first phase is learn to train. Yes, exactly. And I think that's one of the reasons I like the 11, 12 age bracket. We've had a lot of success with kids over the years who started in that 11, 12 age bracket. Like it's funny, Jack Eichel's back training with us right now. And he was talking about the fact, he was like, yeah, I was up in North Andover with Ben Bruno when I was in sixth grade. You know, he said, you know, I started and he's like beastly strong in the weight room. You know, he like cleaned 275 for five the other day. No, no effort at all. And, um, but when you start early, and I look at that, like I said, with you know Mark and Mia that are in the video, they're going to be very, very strong by the time they're seniors in high school. I will not be surprised to see Mia throwing 135 around as a senior in high school in the clean like Michaela was, even though she won't be as big as Michaela. And I won't be surprised to see Mark doing the same thing with you know 185 or 200. They'll be way ahead of their peers because you got that learn to train piece out of the way sooner because you're right no matter when somebody starts if you get a kid at 18 who's never been in the weight room it's still learn to train you're showing that kid push up and bench press and your know, hand position and clean and you know all these things have to be taught and it will take a roughly similar amount of time to teach it almost regardless of when you start like it's you may have you know maybe if you get a talented 18 year old you can get all that done in the summer but it's just a huge advantage to get these kids familiar and comfortable with the weight room at a younger age. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, obviously because of that learning, if they could get in three days because you're not killing them, then they're going to learn probably a little bit quicker. But you're talking about periodization. There is no periodization. It's year round twice a week. Yep. It's year round twice a week. And really it's always in season because again, you know, and these are the realities of, the sporting life is that there just isn't that ability to um, like to have that off season because the kids just don't have it. it. It never really stops. Maybe a little bit in the summer, but even like for us, I'm looking at lacrosse is going to go. We might have July where Mark does not have any sporting requirement at all, but that might be the only month where there's nothing, even at 13. Um, Coach, you said, um, I love this, you said uh, body weight training is a dumb idea. You know, see, that goes be against a lot of what we think. Like, okay, hey, man, they're just starting now. we got to do body weight training. Talk to us about that. Right. Well, what we realize, and this is, it's funny. I, we talk about the idea that sometimes things that get said often enough and get repeated often enough start to be perceived as facts. And the thing, you know, back <laughs> in the old embedded days, body weight before external resistance. And everybody sort of parroted that. And. You'll like this one. I put in one of my new presentations. I have a picture of a parrot and a picture of an owl. And it's like, which one are you? You know, are you the parrot or the owl, the wise owl? Yeah. Because, you know, the parrot just keeps repeating whatever it is. You know, body weight before external resistance. Body weight before external resistance. And that's not accurate when you're talking about upper body. Because kids are going to struggle with their body weight with upper body exercises. They're going to struggle with push-up. They're going to struggle with chin-up. But with lower body, body weight's going to be plenty of resistance. So they're going to be fine with body weight squats and body weight split squats. So we've got to be able to look at that and realize the body weight before external resistance thing is an oversimplification. And that it's not – that's not the way that it is. I always say it's body weight, lower body, and then sort of normal resistance training upper body is probably going to give you better results. Good stuff. Mike, uh, I want to go into the conditioning piece. We got to be careful uh, not to make them slow, but um, is uh, is complete youth conditioning your next product? I don't think so because <laughs> I, I think it would be uh, would be like one of those shortest books in the world kind of product. <laughs> <laughs> because, again, I think, you know, if I look and, I, you know, again, I'm always looking through my own kind of dad lens, but – Someone like Mark, if, if Mark wasn't in the weight room, he'd be getting about five hours a week of running around right now with lacrosse and zero strength work. So I kind of look at it and think, I don't need to have him running around trying to worry about getting him in shape. 
as much as I need to worry about taking care of the strength piece because he's on the field and I would be willing to bet it goes back. And I don't know if I put that, um, the Dan Baker quote in there, but the Dan Baker idea uh, sort of of most of these things that we're doing in practice are in that kind of moderate intensity, cardiac output, you know, 120 to 150 kind of area. They get a ton of that. And again, I don't know what if it, the numbers may not be exactly right for kids, but I think we know what we're talking about in that particular regard. So, yeah, I think for me, it's really all about speed and strength with kids and very little. I think the biggest mistake parents can make is looking at kids and thinking, oh, they need to be in better shape. Like, I, don't, I don't think so. They need to be bigger. They need to be stronger. They need to be faster. Save the conditioning for later. There'll be a time when that becomes important, but it's not it's not in that like 11 to 14 kind of bracket at all, and it's certainly not below that. Cool, Coach. You know what? Uh, you you had a thing, a uh, slide in there. What do they need? Throw, jump, sprint, weights. Give us the just the quick uh, view of what they need. And I think you said it. They need to throw medicine balls. They need to do basic plyometric exercises. They need to run short sprints, the, the kind of Tony Holler, time 10, flying 10 sort of thing. The kids love that stuff. And then they need a basic strength program. And I think you watch the product, the strength program. Some people are going to look at that and go, that's it? And I'm like, yep, that's it. Much like the you know the reading, writing, arithmetic thing in school. If you went to school and you thought, what, no physics? No chemistry? It's like, no, it's elementary school, guys. There's no physics and there's no chemistry. Okay, there's math facts and there's spelling and there's reading. And I think we have to have that same approach in the weight room. And that was one of the slides that was in there. We, you know, we squat. We're goblet squatting. And people are like, but Mike, you don't believe in squatting. And I'm like, I don't believe in heavy spinal loading for experienced athletes, that's different than getting a kid to understand the basics of strength and conditioning, the basics of being in the weight room. Yeah, and I, I think there's a bunch of those in here uh, too. Just to remind everybody, you know, like like you said, uh, you know, you are doing goblet squats, you are doing, uh, you know, you're not, you don't want to do just body weight. You do, you're not going to condition. There's a lot in here. You know, you even talked about what do they need in terms of equipment because there's some psychological stuff going on here. So I really like uh, the way you kind of put this together educating parents i think uh you know it's a one way that you know you want to talk about sales you can learn so much in these first two presentations to be able to talk to parents and sell them on your program and how important it is and we need to start making those changes so uh, i'll remind everybody we got a link to the product at strengthcoachpodcast.com or on continuefit.com so coach thanks for coming on great job with this as always and uh, we'll talk to you next time all right thanks Ant. i appreciate it